So in the last class we were talking about uh, equity risk. We said that equity risk is always higher than the default risk because the stock price can go down even though the company doesn't fail. Okay? And if the company fails, equity has a worse status than debt. So equity is always more risky than debt. Okay? For the cost of debt, uh, the default risk, we can look at things like the financial ratios, like the interest coverage ratio, and we can use the help of the rating agencies. But for equity risk, the rating agencies is not that useful, because the rating agencies are measuring default risk. Okay? But equity risk is different from default risk. So, we said we use the capital asset pricing model that we're going to spend the next while talking about. So first of all, we can think of risk for stock as variance around expected returns, okay? Is the stock price changing a lot or not compared to what we expected? Then we talked about uh, the different types of risk we can have and the fact that we can diversify we can diversify the firm risk, we can diversify the competition risk, we can com diversify the industry risk, we can diversify the country risk. Okay. Uh, then we finished here the last time looking at the headlines and seeing was it positive or negative news and what kind of risk we were talking about. So. <coughs> The firm specific risk or the other risks, we can just increase the number of investments of our portfolio to reduce the risk, but market-wide risk cannot. Okay? So, when we diversify, we already discussed about diversification. If we have a large portfolio of a lot of different stocks, there's two reasons why we have the firm specific risk is lower. Okay. Each investment is a much smaller percentage of the portfolio, which muting means making smaller the effect, overall effect. So we said that if I just invest 5% in Volkswagen and Volkswagen stock price goes down, just a small effect on my portfolio. Does everybody understand portfolio? That's an important word. What does portfolio mean? set of different investments, right? So I have a portfolio, it could be 5% could be gold, okay? 10% could be in Volkswagen, okay? 20% could be in Coca-Cola, okay? 20% could be in real estate, in, in a house, okay? Housing, in real estate, okay? And so on. That all is called a portfolio. Okay, portfolio is like a group of investments. Okay, so if I just invest 10% in Volkswagen, then it's not a big deal. Okay, Volkswagen stock price goes down by 30%, I just lose 3% of my money. But if I invested 100% in Volkswagen, all my money in Volkswagen, then I'm in trouble. Stock price goes down 30%, I lose 30% of my investment. Okay. So, the second one is that firm-specific actions can be positive or negative. In a large portfolio, these effects will average out to zero. So, you know, some companies are going to do well. For example, Coca-Cola does well, okay? Some companies are going to do badly. Volkswagen does badly, okay? Let's say the gold does well. The housing does badly, okay? So the, that's the second point of diversification. The first point is, if I diversify one company, it's just a small amount of my portfolio. Second point is, if I diversify, we have something is good, something is bad. And they will average out. Okay? So we, we, we showed the equation before, when we talked about diversification. For showing exactly the advantage of diversification. So let's move on to the marginal investor. So 
The marginal investor is the investor who's most likely to be investing in your firm. So we can look at the marginal investor on page uh, 46 of the book. Okay. So they are the person who's going to influence the stock price. They are going to be the most likely buyer or seller on the next trade. Okay. So generally speaking, the marginal investor owns a lot of stock and trades the stock regularly. So, uh, this question, we'll answer this question in a minute. So, uh, the largest investor might not be the marginal investor. For example, Bill Gates. Do you know Bill Gates? Yeah. Or Michael Dell? So, Bill Gates is the largest investor in Microsoft. Michael Dell is the largest investor in Dell computers. But are they trading their stocks every day? No, right? So they have to own a large amount of stocks and trade, buy and sell the stocks. Okay? So very often the founder or the manager might own a lot of stocks, but they're not the marginal investor because they're not buying and selling the stock. Okay? So we just assume. We assume that the marginal investor is well diversified. Okay? So most investors are going to have a portfolio. There are some investors who just invest in one stock, false one. Okay, but most investors have a portfolio and are diversified. So, how do we identify the marginal investor? Right, we have four lines here. Right, if the firm has small institutional holdings but large holdings by individual investor, then the individual investor. Okay, so we can see this on this table here. Right, so the institutional investors on a lot of stock. The insiders is Bill Gates an ins insider he, or not? Is Bill Gates an insider in Microsoft? Yes, the inside. Do you understand inside? Person who's inside the company. So then, the marginal investor is the institutional investor. Institutional investor. We talked about it the first week. I said we'll keep saying these words again and again, right? So that's why you have to study hard in the first few weeks and learn the vocabulary, okay? Can anybody tell me what, is it, what does institutional investor mean? What is an institutional investor compared to an individual investor? It, that is inside the company. No, that's an inside investor. It can be a company, not just one person. Example, a lot of rich men uh, buy stocks together. Yes. And share them between them. What's that called when they all the people invest their money together? Investment bank. Hmm? Fund, right? So then the institution is managing funds. Okay. So they make a fund. They advertise the fund. You decide to invest in the fund. They could make a fund like this, right? and then you decide to invest in the fund, they are an institution, they are a group, a bank, organization, a fund manager, okay? Institution is like group or organization or company. So, most people are investing, they're not, you have some rich people who will just invest by themselves, but most people are investing through institutions, right? They, they go and they invest in a fund. If we think of pension funds, do you understand pension fund? Yangum Fund, Korean Government Pension Fund, that's an example of an institutional investor. Okay? Everybody puts their money together for the pension and it's invested by the Korean Government. Okay? An institute. That, is that a lot of money? Do you think pension funds around the world have a lot of money or a little bit of money? A lot of money, right? There are a lot of people, the population is getting older, there's more and more money going into pension funds. That's just government pension funds, but we also have private pension funds and company pension funds. One large investor in England is British Telecom. It's like SK. Do you know SK? So SK has some pension fund for its employees. Okay? They're going to invest the money. Where is SK going to invest its employees' pension fund? Right? It could invest in gold, in bonds, in stocks. So it's going to be investing in companies. They invest in stocks. So institutional investors. So then the marginal investor is the institutional investor. 
Are pension funds trading stocks or not trading stocks? Are fund managers trading stocks or not trading stocks? Hmm? Buying and selling stocks or not buying and selling stocks? Every day. Hmm? Depends on the fund, but many fund managers are buying and selling stocks, right? You put in a new order. He puts in a new order for this fund. I need to buy the stocks. Do you understand? I get more money for the pensions today. What am I going to do with the money? Invest it, okay? Buy more stocks. Do you understand? So the fund managers are institutional investors are buying and selling. They're trading stocks. They might be doing more buying than selling. But they can also sell. It depends on the fund. If you invest in an ETF, exchange traded fund, it means you invest in the 500 biggest companies. They're not normally buying and selling. But if you invest in a managed fund, then they're selling a lot, right? Oh, this company's not going well, sell the stock, okay? This company's doing well, buy the stock. So, we have institutions. If both of them are high, then the institutional investor. Why? Because the insiders are not trading their stocks. Okay? Michael Dell, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg are sitting on their stock and not trading them. Okay? In this case, it's a little bit tricky. We don't have many institutional investors, but we have a lot of insiders, like founder of the company, owns most of the company. Right? Only if the insiders trade, it could be the insiders. If not, it's still the uh, it could be in individual investors, right? Individual investors could be high. So we have individual investors, institutions, or insiders. Uh, so we could have a wealthy individual investor, not an insider, right? Then, but they're still, if it's a wealthy individual investor, they're still diversified. Okay? Uh, this can we can have the case where we have a lot of small individual investors. But normally, the point we're making here is that normally the marginal investor is either an institutional investor or wealthy individual who's well diversified. Okay? So the point we want to make is that the marginal investor is diversified. Okay? So the person who's buying or trading the stock usually is a diversified investor. Does everybody understand that? Yes? We can look at each company, may have a different investment investor base. So let's look at some companies. Here's Disney. Disney has 72% institutional investors, pension funds, money funds, bank, investment banks. Okay? It has 21% wealthy individuals, insider 7%. Okay? So Walt Disney's great 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 grandchildren own 7% of the company. Okay? Some wealthy individual, I don't know, some guy from Saudi Arabia who owns a lot of oil. Maybe he has a lot of Disney toys in his room. Maybe he likes playing with the Disney toys. Okay? So he decided to invest a lot of money in Disney, right? He loves Disney. He goes there every year and dresses up like Mickey Mouse and goes to the theme park, right? But he has a lot of money from oil. So he invests billions of dollars in Disney. Okay, so what the individuals? So who's the marginal investor in Disney? Institutions. Institutions. Deutsche Bank, who's the marginal investor? Institutions. Okay, Aracruz is a company in India. Or sorry, Aracruz was in Brazil. And Tata Chemicals is in India. In Aracruz, who is the, in Brazil, who is the marginal investor? Individuals. Are those individuals diversified or not diversified? If they're wealthy individuals, do you think they're diversified or not diversified? Diversified, right? Do you think the guy in Saudi Arabia only invests in Disney? No, he invests in a lot of other companies and areas. Okay? And then Tata Chemicals, again, is institutions. We can see insiders is a little bit high on Tata Chemicals in countries, emerging economies. Even in Korea, we see more insider family-run companies. Okay, if you look at Samsung, maybe Samsung has more of the family or more of the company. Okay, so uh, who are the top investors? Who are the wealthy people who are investing in Disney? 
Steve Jobs, right? Passed away, but Steve Jobs trust. So he, Steve Jobs is a billionaire. He decided to invest money in Disney. Okay? But he's diversified. He invests in other areas. Steve Jobs must have liked Disney, right? Fidelity Investments. Fidelity Investments is an investment company. Like, I want, a lot of people, when they invest money, they think about their pensions. So pensions is a big thing, right? If we think of pensions and people with oil money, where are people from oil money from? What countries do they live in? People with oil money. Middle, Middle, Middle East. Where else? Uh, Russia. Russia. South America. Right? Those kind of wealthy people. We also have sovereign wealth funds, the governments. China has a lot of savings, Chinese government. One of the big pension funds is Norway. Norway has a lot of oil, but Norway has a good system for the oil. All the money goes into the pension fund. Right? In other countries, a little bit more, they, they were unlucky because they found oil earlier. But Norway saw the mistake of all the other countries, and they said, this much money has to go towards the country's pension fund. Right? So Norway has a massive pension fund now. Okay? And they're investing money. So Fidelity, you save money for your investment, for your pension, you give it to Fidelity, State Street, Barclays, Vanguard Groups, Saudi Asset, AXA, they're all investment companies. Do you want to work for any of those investment companies? Do you want to work for an investment company after you graduate? Hmm? One of the best paid sectors, if you're interested in money, right? Investment banking is one of the best paid sectors in the economy, right? You can get some qualification after you graduate about uh, set buying and selling stocks, right? Some license to buy and sell stocks, that kind of thing. Work for the investment company or investment <laughs> bank. Okay, again, the same here, investment companies. Okay, insurance companies. Tata Sons, here we can see the, company, the sons of the owner own the company, okay? So this just gives us an idea of who the marginal investors are. So, assuming diversification costs nothing, and all assets that can be traded, the limit of diversification is to hold a portfolio of every single asset. We already talked about this. This is the market portfolio. Okay? So I gave this simple portfolio here. But we could make the market portfolio, which is everything in the world. Every company in the world, everything like gold, copper, or iron, cocoa beans, okay? Every financial asset that is traded in the world, we invest in that. That's the market portfolio, okay? So every investor holds some combination of the risk-free asset and the market portfolio. So we compare the risk-free asset and the market portfolio, okay? So no risk. 100% US government bonds, zero risk, okay? What about the market portfolio? Does the market portfolio have risk or no risk? Risk, right? We invest in all those different things, so it's a low risk, but it's still risky, risk has risk, okay? Uh, so, if we want some risk, we invest half our money in government bonds and half in the market portfolio, more risk, 25% in government bonds, 75% in the market portfolio. Even more risk, 100% in market portfolio. Even more risk, borrow money, invest in the market. Okay? Even more risk, invest not in the market. We're talking about the market portfolio now, but we could invest just one company. Even more risk. Okay? Even more risk, go to the casino and put our money on red or black. Okay, but this is normally the case for investors, right? Investors don't normally just invest in one company, okay? They invest in funds and they're diversified. So then, the risk of any individual asset, we come back to the capital asset pricing model, which we're using for the price of equity. This is the risk it adds to the market portfolio. So we said that the Marginal investor who's investing in companies is diversified, okay? They're already invested in the market portfolio, more or less, okay? So the risk for them of investing in our company is going to be 
Does my company add risk to the market portfolio or not? How much risk does it add to the market portfolio? So this is measured statistically by how much the asset moves with the market, called the covariance. So we may have mentioned covariance before, but let's say we use the S&P 500. S&P 500, 500 largest companies in the US, right? And we see how is the S&P 500 moving? This is going to be the market portfolio, okay? And then we look at our stock. Okay, does our stock move with the market portfolio? Okay, it has a covariance of one, a correlation of one, moving together. Or does it move opposite to the market portfolio? Okay, my art is not very good, but this is the opposite way, right? Market market is going up, this one is going down. Okay, then this will have a covariance of minus one. Okay, so which one is adding more risk to my investment? The blue or the black? Blue is adding more risk, right? It's the same risk. But black is taking away risk from my investments. It's going the opposite of the market portfolio. Okay? So this is how we're measuring the risk of an individual company. One way, with beta. Beta is going to measure this. It's a number between zero, sorry, minus one and, and can keep going up. Uh, which tells us the relationship of the stock with the market portfolio. Okay? So why are we worried about the relationship of the stock with the market portfolio? Can anybody tell me? Why are we worried about that relationship? The relationship of the individual company with the market portfolio. Why are we worried about that relationship? I'm a company and I'm selling my stock to investors, okay? Why are we worried about the relationship between my stock and the market portfolio? We just discussed about marginal investors, okay? Because marginal investors are diversified. They are invested in the market portfolio, okay? So we're thinking about risk from whose eyes? From whose eyes are we looking at risk? Marginal investors. Where has the marginal investor invested their money? In the market portfolio. Okay? They are diversified. They've already invested their money in the market portfolio. We're looking at risk through their eyes because they're the person most likely to be buying or selling the stock. Okay? If we look at risk through their eyes, we're worried about the relationship of our company with the market portfolio. Okay? then that will tell us the risk for the investors. So that's the point. So let's think about a couple of things here. Gold. What do you think about gold? Do you think gold moves with the stock market usually or against the stock market usually? Against. Why? Yes, why? Not always, but usually, right? Why does gold move against the stock market? Gold is stable. Stable. So what happens when the stock market is going down? Why? Because gold has security in price. Mm -hmm. So if market price goes down, mm -hmm. then gold gold price is stable. So why? What are people doing? Um, buy. What are they selling? Selling their stocks and buying gold, right? Stock market is falling. We're selling our stocks. We could keep our money in cash, but the gold price is going up, right? So we invest in gold. So do you think gold is going to have a high expected return or a low expected return? High risk or low risk? Low risk, because we're thinking about the relationship of gold with the market portfolio. Okay, we talked about video games before. Okay, what about a company like Ducati? Do you know Ducati? Italian company that makes luxury motorbikes. Okay? What about their relationship with the market portfolio? The stock market is going down. The economy is not doing well. Are people buying Ducatis, luxury motorbikes? No, not at all, right? They could have big trouble. What about in the 
case where the stock market is going up and everybody's getting a lot of money. They feel very rich. Are they going to go out and buy a luxury motorbike? Yes. Are a lot of people going to go out and buy luxury motorbikes? Yes, maybe, right? Maybe they'll regret later when the economy goes down. Why did I spend all my money on a luxury motorbike? Now I don't have enough money to pay for food, right? So, anyway, Ducati is going to be risky. Okay, so we're going to have a high number here. High risk or high expected return. Because we put in beta here, beta number is going to be high for Ducati. And we're going to multiply that by the expected return on the market portfolio. Okay? So, we're going to, we're just introducing now, we're going to talk about these in more detail, how to find this and how to find beta, right? We're just introducing, beta is obtained by dividing the covariance of any asset with the market by the variance of the market. It is the measure of the non-diversifiable risk for any asset. Okay? The market changes. The question is, does the stock change with the market or against it? The, market, the stock change with the market? Ducati. Okay? It changes against the market? Gold. Okay? So that's the question we're asking here. When the market, the market is changing all the time, but does our stock change more with the market or against the market? That's what Beta is asking. So this is called the Capital Asset Pricing Model. There are some limitations. It makes some unrealistic assumptions. We can't estimate the parameters of the model precisely. We can't say calculate the market portfolio, every stock in the world. So we just use indexes like S&P 500 or Global Index. Okay. The firm can change during the estimation period. So with beta we're looking at the history. Did the company move with the market or not? Okay? But company could change. Okay? Can you give me an example of a company which changed its business in the last five years or ten years? It was doing one business and now it changed to another business. Microsoft. Microsoft, what business did they change? Uh, in the beginning they only made Windows and now they made uh, phones. Yes. So Microsoft used to make just this, now they're making smartphones and Xboxes and things like that, right? Yes. The change between like you can say one thing and do another. Yes. Well, yes. That no. Just changing means just going into different businesses, starting new businesses. You don't have to cancel the old business, right? So just if the company is changing, let's say I was a, I was Ducati selling motorbikes, and now I start selling gold instead, right? then the information of the beta is not going to be correct. So we're just saying this is some limitation of the model, right? Maybe the model doesn't work well where company changed their business. <coughs> so, uh, again, we're in a way we're predicting the future, okay? But the reality is that the relationship between betas and returns is weak. So we, we make this guess, we make this equation, we make this guess about the risk and the return. But in, in the real life, it doesn't actually happen, right? So, anyway, basically, we can't predict the future, but this model is the most widely used one. Okay, there are some other models, which we're not going to study, but they're called multi-factor models, proxy models, and APM, which use a lot more data. Right? The CPAM is just using uh, mainly the beta. Okay? But these, these ones use a lot more data, but they don't actually give any better, they haven't performed any better than the CPAM at calculating the future return. Okay? So what we're doing with the model, this model, is we're trying to calculate the expected return. So we're saying next year, right? Next year, what is Microsoft's return? Okay? So we're guessing. We're going to say it's 10%. Okay? It could be wrong. It could be 15%. It could be minus 10%. Okay? 
But we are trying to figure out what is the risk and return of this stock. That's what we're trying to do. Okay? So we make this model. Where do we get 10% from? The risk free rate, 2%, plus data times the risk premium. Say the risk premium is 5%, and Microsoft is 1, beta is 1, work moves with the market, then it's going to be 10%. Okay? That's what we guess, but next year it could go up 15% or down 10%. Okay? So we have other models which do the same thing, but the point is, these models are no better than the CAPM at predicting the future. Okay? They don't do any better at predicting the future. They can do a better job at telling us why something happened in the past, but not at predicting a future. So we're going to focus on CAPM because it's simpler and widely used. Okay? So why is the CAPM used? Okay? The alternative models can explain the past, but they are not as accurate when estimating the future. The alternative models are more complicated and require more information. Okay? So it's not worth the extra trouble of doing the alternative models. We should just use the CAPM. So we can look about any firm on Yahoo. Okay? So this is uh, just some homework for the next time. Just choose a firm, go to Yahoo, enter your company symbol and choose profile. And this is on the website, so you don't need to take a picture. Right? Just go to the website, equity risk. Okay? And see who is the marginal investor. Is it an institutional investor or an insider? Okay? So <coughs> Just, we can just look at how to do that now. You're going to check for your own firm. We can check here for, we can use Microsoft in the class. So just, it helps you just to get familiar with Yahoo Finance. <coughs> so we go to Yahoo Finance. We type in our company's name. I just start typing micro. So you can use whatever company you use for the last one, you can use again, right? <coughs> so if I just start typing in the name, it should come up in the underneath. The here we can see Microsoft, right? Click on Microsoft, go to profile on the left. Click on profile. So, <laughs> you can see here the corporate, they have the corporate governance scores, okay? We can see the main executives. And here we have View Insiders down here. And click on View Insiders. Okay. Tells us the insider transactions. Who are the insiders in Microsoft? Here we can see Gates, William, Bill Gates. He was he's selling some stocks. Okay. Uh, total insiders insider shares. Okay. Held here. Uh, sales purchased, change in institutional shares held. So here in ownership, we can also see major holders. So who is the main holders of shares in Microsoft, right? So uh, top institutional holders here. Vanguard, top mutual fund holders, and major direct holders. Actually, Will Gates is not the main holder now. Balmer, Steve, Steve Balmer, who started the company with Bill Gates, he owns this many shares, right? Bill Gates owns this many shares. But Vanguard Group, institutional investor, they own more shares, 485, right? Bill Gates owns 206, he owns 333. So we can get an idea 
of the percentage, right? Percentage of shares held by insiders, 4%. Percentage of shares held by institutional mutual fund holders, 73%. Okay? So then we, we know how much uh, the breakdown of ownership of Microsoft. Okay? So Yahoo Finance ownership on the left, major holders. Okay? And we can see the insiders. Are they trading or are they not trading their stock? Okay? If you were invested in Microsoft and Bill Gates starts selling all his stock, would you be worried? Yes, maybe. Would you start selling your stock too? Yes. Yes, right. So one reason why the insiders don't sell their stock much, okay? They, they want to hold on to their stock to give confidence in the company. So do you understand the task? So find out how, what percentage are insiders, what percentage are institutional investors for your company. I'll ask you in the next class. Okay, so right now then, let's discuss these questions. You can use your book and uh, PPT to answer the question about what we just studied. So the first one, give an example of a type of industry risk. So discuss with your partner. Here's your book to help you, right? Industry risk is on page 45, number three, industry risk. Okay? So just look back in the book, help you to answer the question with your partner. Answer the first question. Who can give an example of a type of industry risk? Anybody? Technological risk. What could happen? A new technology comes along. Can you give me an example of when a new technology came along? CDs and MP3 players. Okay. Okay, number two. Discuss with your partner, what do we mean by market risk? What is market risk? We can see market risk on page 45. First discuss with your partner. Thank you. 
So just, I get a little bit worried when I see people who are holding the attendance and changing all the pages and clicking more than one name, right? So just, it should be very quick. You know where your name is, you just check your name and you pass the attendance sheet to the next person. Okay, don't check for other people. They have, they're in the class, they have a pen, they can do that themselves, okay? So don't spend a long time looking, changing pages. You know where your name is by now, okay? Just find your name, check, the, check your name and pass it to the next person, okay? Okay, so uh, what's the answer to the second question? What is market risk? Can anybody tell me? Like the interest rate is an example, but what are we talking about? Yes? Yes. Okay. Okay, so we're talking about we'll talk about the risk premium in a while, the market portfolio. Okay? The risk that affects the market portfolio. It affects every company in the world. Okay? The market portfolio moves up and down. Okay? Sometimes the global economy is doing well. Macroeconomic factors are going well. The market portfolio is moving up. Okay? Sometimes the global economy is not going well. The market portfolio is going down. We can't diversify that risk. Okay? The market portfolio is going up. Market portfolio is going down. We're already well diversified. Okay? So like I said, inflation, interest rates, macroeconomic factors. Okay? Uh, then the next question, how does the CAPM measure equity risk? So what three things? What three things does the CAPM use to measure equity risk? It uses three things. So it's quite simple really, compared to the other model. We're just using three things. So discuss with your partner. So we should be, we should know, we're not memorizing the equations, but we should, when we get familiar, we should know this equation, right? So what three things does, does it use to measure the market risk? So we have the risk-free, we call that RF, risk-free return, right? We use that for everything, risk. Then the second thing? Yeah, so the market portfolio, right? And we call this premium. Okay, the premium is how much more is it risky to invest in the market portfolio than the risk-free investment, right? And what else? Beta. Beta. What is beta? What does beta tell us? The relationship of two things. What two things? The relationship of the firm and the market portfolio. Okay. So by using those three things, we can calculate the cost of equity or the risk of a company, individual company. Okay? That's the CAM. So then, question number four, discuss with your partner. According to the CAPM then, what is the best investment for an equity investor? 
If I'm going to invest my money, according to the CAPM, what's the best investment? Where should I invest my money? According to this theory. Anybody answer? Should be a quick answer. Diversify, what's, what's the most diversification we can do? Market portfolio, okay? So according to the CAPM, the best investment is a market portfolio. But one problem is the CAPM doesn't think about transaction cost. Transaction cost means I want to buy real estate in Nigeria. Maybe I need to fly to Nigeria and I need to pay a broker in Nigeria. Their transaction cost takes a lot of time, right? But this is theory, okay? In theory, the best investment is investing in everything in the world. So then, uh, let's take a break now for 10 minutes.